We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah, and may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and His family and His companions and all those who tread His path. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us and you a life upon His path. Say Ameen. And a death while adhering to His guidance, and a reunion around Him, and a drink from His blessed hand on the Day of Judgment, the Day of Thirst, Allahumma Ameen. And an opportunity to see the face of His Lord in ours, Allahumma Ameen. So I was asked to speak about discussions with an atheist. And while the majority of this uh, session is preparatory knowledge uh, for the uh, exercises uh, outside, for the da'wah that you will be partaking in, inshallah, in Inner Harbor, Baltimore, I wish to actually step back. There will still, inshallah, be some value here towards that. Uh, but actually speak a little bit about speaking one-on-one -on -one with someone that may be having atheistic inclinations, the spectrum entirely, uh, in your personal lives. For the past 20 years, and I'm not an anomaly, but I've sort of been quite involved uh, with people that come to me wondering how to speak this to this relative or this colleague that has become an atheist or is considering atheism or otherwise. And of course... Da'wah is a duty, and there's no reason why we should pick and choose between da'wah to Muslims or non-Muslims. But if there ever was, uh, you know, a, a lack of resources, time or otherwise, al-hifdu ala al-mawjud, muqaddam ala talab al mafqud that, you know, protecting uh, those that are within the fold take priority over seeking and delivering the message to those outside the fold. Again, we create false dichotomies all the time and do either or, and I, I don't see any justification for that. Uh, but just for the sake of catering to this need, what happens when someone that is Muslim uh, comes to you and they're sort of uh, flirting with atheism? Well, first and foremost, let me say up front, that can be any one of us, and so we need to sort of preempt these things. Prevention is better than a cure. Always has. I've dealt with countless cases, and I would like to think of myself as somewhat more trained than the average layman on this subject, but still, what does 20 years do? Ask anyone in my space. Our retention levels, the people you're actually able to walk away from that very dark cliff, right, are actually very few, because once they're actually at that point, it's very hard, at least at that moment, to walk them back. For reasons we will cover, but in general, prevention is better than a cure. That prevention is through solidifying faith. Faith is solidified through association. You want to make sure they want to associate with you and with your community and with your deen. You know, the socio-emotional element is huge. It's a huge part and the most common reason why people subscribe to faiths, whatever they may be, association. The other one is persuasion. Muslims need to immunize themselves and their fellow Muslims by never thinking it's a given that we have already very good reasons to be persuaded of the truth of Islam, that it's not blind faith. When the, you know, the prevailing paradigms, the widespread sentiment is all religions are man-made, all religions are blind faith. We don't live in some insulated, ghettoized community. We're a part of this world. It's in the ether. And so we need the intellectual component and the spiritual component, if you're a naturalist and not just an evidentialist, but persuasion. And then third is experience. That's the third channel of faith and solidifying faith. And we cannot do that for people, but we have to set up the mechanisms for people to experience faith on their own, to try to encourage them along, you know, talk to them by day and pray for them by night. Prevention is better than, than a cure. That was point number one. Point number two, uh, hijab, forgive me. We'll talk about it in the parking lot, all right? Don't debate with them. <laughs> Um, no, hear me out. Of course there's a utility to debate, to debate. But so many times we have these huge fumbles that didn't have to go south as far as they did or as fast as they did because we're making certain assumptions and we dive into the debate with these presuppositions about how things are going to get better. So for instance, as I told you, association is the number one reason for people to, to get solidified in faith. It's also the number one reason for people to have fallouts, right? 
many people may not even realize it about themselves. It's actually unconscious. But the emotionality is playing a far greater role than the rationality, even if they don't notice. So just take it easy and don't take the deep dive. Don't jump into the rabbit hole and don't just talk to them. And, because that may not be the issue to begin with. There could just be a shubha. Just some confusion needs clarification. Or there could be underlying emotional issues. And there's so many of them that cause them, you know, to want to leave. And that takes a completely different remedy, right? But in, in essence, always keep that in mind. Is this person, you know, struggling with, you know, wanting to be right? They really want like an intellectually stimulating and satisfying answer for Islam? Or are they struggling for wanting to be liked, right? They feel like a misfit in society or in the community or an inferiority complex of sorts or otherwise. That's actually the most common reason. The data does suggest this. So keep that in mind. Don't just jump in. Don't just, you know, interlock with them. Check for the root cause. That's very important. And then, if it is an intellectual discussion, we're going to have a dialogue here. That dialogue needs to be had by the right people. So once again, don't just debate with them. Because unless you're trained, unless you're a specialist, these people can walk out of the conversation nodding their head or lifting their nose in the sky and say, see, told you there's no answer, right? So you can actually be a bad lawyer for a very good case and wind up confirming their biases for them against God and Islam. And so don't underestimate this. Be very careful about just jumping in. Also because, you know, as debates continue, people get more and more defensive. It is just natural. Like the ego lurks. And I, the word is operative, lurks, hides in all of these discussions. You know, like really think about it. When was the last time, you know, the, the stakes on the debate went high, online or in person? And then from that point, people say, you know what? You're right, I'm wrong. I step down from my position and I adopt your position. You have superior intelligence. Have you ever seen that in like social media comment section before? Because I haven't, right? It doesn't work like this. And because they feel cornered now that they've asserted a position and you've asserted the opposite and everyone's watching and so on. That's why, I just love this ayah. I love this ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Right? You know, this very famous verse. Invite, you're not just declaring and shouting down, shouting down the truth down their throat. <laughs> no one's going to accept that. Humans are like seat belts. They don't come with snatching, right? Call, invite. Make it appealing. Invite to the way of your Lord with hikmah, with wisdom, in calculated ways, right? Then he says, pay attention. hasana, And with beautiful preaching or good preaching. Wajadilhum, see there's room for debate. And debate with them. Billati hi ahsan in a way that's most beautiful or best, right? Think about those three layers of a conversation. You see, when Allah said, invite them. He said wisdom. He didn't say beautiful wisdom. Because wisdom by definition is beautiful, right? You're calculated. You're figuring out the, the, the most strategic way to work around their defense mechanisms to not trigger their ego, right? And so it would be ineloquent of the Quran to say beautiful wisdom when wisdom by definition is beautiful, right? Crafting your narrative is an act of ibadah, beautifying your proposal. So hikmah. But then he says, وَالْمَوْعِظَةِ hasana, And beautiful preaching or good preaching because you know the word mau'idha to appreciate this verse and the layers here mau'idha is not like ta'leem it's not like nasiha nasiha is like when you tell someone by the way you have to cover your entire foot with water in order for the wudu to be valid right that's nasiha just a reminder it's just stating a point of information mau'idha is a heartfelt reminder like when the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said Woe to the ankles from the fire. Meaning, hey, stop thinking this is a small thing. Stop underestimating it. So when he mentions the downside of overlooking, getting the water there, that's mau'idha. Why is that important? When you start getting emotional, right? It could have an equal and opposite reaction. You get it? And so Allah then qualifies beautiful preaching. Because once emotions get involved in preaching, you're going to have reciprocated emotion. So you got to now be... Make sure you're preaching in a beautiful way. But then he says, وَجَادِلْهُمْ And debate with them. Meaning, and if you're going to debate with them. <laughs> then debate with them, not in a way that's beautiful. It, debate with them, بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ Right, the superlative they call it. In the most beautiful way. Because when the conversation gets heartfelt, 
and then it escalates to a debate, then the stakes are higher. The defense mechanism is even higher. The lack of receptiveness is even more present. So you need to be even more crafty and even more beautiful and even more gentle to work around it. Does this make sense? And so it's called read the room. It's called emotional intelligence. We have all these terms for it. The Quran says, know where you stand at the different phases of a conversation. So that all this, so that you, you can work around it and you don't push them away instead of inviting them. Because the ayah begins by saying invite. You know when the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تكونوا عونا للشيطان على أخيكم Don't be an assistant to shaitan against your brother. You know how you can help shaitan against your brother? One of two ways. One of them is watering down the truth, right? So you're not making it clear what you're calling me to, right? The beauty of Islam is irrecognizable. But the other way is <laughs> that you stuff the truth down his throat. No, you need it in front of his eyes. You need to like wave it at his heart. <laughs> you don't want to just stuff it down their throat. That's the other way you can help shaitan against your brother. May Allah protect us from that. Say ameen. And so the idea is hikmah. Hikmah is about how do I heal this particular person? How do I win them over? How do I make a point in the most productive way? And many a times that is by, don't debate them. Refer them to experts who can have this conversation with them. One of the things I love to do is to refer them to written resources because you can't really talk back to an article. <laughs> can't talk back to a book. So it's a strategic way to keep it a one-way conversation. And there's less stakes. He's not saying as much so he won't have to swallow as much of his ego if he wants to concede to some of my points or the points that I'm proposing, right? We're inviting to Allah here. Always remember that. You're not inviting to yourself. Be very humble. Allah could turn the light on in their heart, turn the light off in your heart, right? Stay close to Allah. Stay humble. Ask Him to open this person's heart, make you an instrument of guidance, keep you guided, all of that. So, and just focus on moistening their hearts. You know, I'll tell you, some of even like the, the staunch opposition to the Prophet ﷺ, they were very stuck in like being forced to listen to him. You guys know the famous hadith of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah never became Muslim, by the way. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was one of his staunchest enemies, ﷺ. He was the one that came to him and said, Muhammad, listen, man. And like, uh, uh, let me uh, adapt the translation. His words, if you read the between the lines, he's basically telling the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, cut the nonsense, cut the crap. Right? Like he's telling you, I'm calling you to God, not me. I'm not asking you for wealth and so on. Imagine all these ayat. Then the Prophet والسلام, is approached by Utbah. And Utbah's like, listen, what do you want? You want money. You do want money. We're just not offering enough money. Is that what it is? You want money? We'll gather money for you. You want women? Give you all the women. You, you, are you sick? We'll spend all our, we'll go broke. We'll get you a doctor. If you're bananas, <laughs> if you're nuts, you're cr we'll help you. Just, so he's totally, you know, insulting the Prophet والسلام, And this could have been in front of like a huge crowd. Of, and what does the Prophet ﷺ do? He just listens. He listens. He indulges him. And then after he finishes, he says to him, Antahayta ya Abu Walid. Are you done yet, O Abu Walid? You know Abu Walid, the father of Al Walid? Uh, when the Arabs want to respect someone, they call him father of so and so. <laughs> right? He says, he waits. And then he asks him, are you finished? And he calls him by an honorific, father of Al-Walid. And so the guy's forced to say, yeah, I guess I'm done. <laughs> you know, like essentially, obviously this is a 2022 translation, right? But he says, yeah. Now hear me out. And he totally disregards all of the personal stuff. And he begins to recite to him Surah Fussilat. And about a page and a half into Surah Fussilat, Abu Al-Walid still hasn't cut him off. Right? And not just now is the world here in Quran, and not just now has he won the moral battle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and won the negotiation, if you will, the intellectual negotiation. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah has no choice but to get up and grab the Prophet's mouth and say, please stop. Fearing, he, he felt it himself. This, like, he, this is an admittal of defeat when you're reciting verses of the punishment of the previous nations for their rebel, rebellion and your guy who's saying you're, you're talking nonsense has to tell you, please stop. And he literally holds the Prophet's mouth, stop. This is an art, right? May Allah Azza wa make us artists of da'wah. Say ameen. 
And so, <coughs> moistening their hearts through your manners, the incident of Utu al-Rabi'ah is a big part of this. Also, moistening their hearts, trying to revive their spirituality. Like some person may think if a person is not Muslim or doesn't believe in God, there's no point in me trying to like uh, tenderize their heart in a spiritual way because they don't believe a spirit exists. But that doesn't matter. You know that a spirit exists. And Allah revealed to you a little secret called a fitrah. There's a fitrah. They have a fitrah. You invoke their fitrah. You know, when the man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said to him, I find hardness in my heart. What do I do? He said, Zuri al-Maqbara wamsah ala ra's al yatim Visit the graveyard and caress the head of the orphan. Go see the dead. Go see the vulnerable. Go see how unpredictable life is. You think this will not revive questions and make inquisitive and less defensive. It will not sober up so many people that just don't want to think about God right now. This awakens their spirit. See, the, the real issue nowadays, by the way, like wh why, why is atheism out and about? Why is it abound? It's because of science, right? I actually would say yes, just to meet the, 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 my interlocutor if I'm debating or whatever. I'd say, yeah, I agree. Science does, you know, cause atheism. The, the advancement in science in our age caused the advancement of atheism. It's pretty clear. Science caused atheism. But it's not like science has disproven God. That's just ridiculous, right? Like what? How does physics... Tell me about the metaphysical, the unseen world, when we're observing what we can see. It's just, you need to remove that discussion from the physics department altogether. No, that's not the issue. The scientific instruments of our age have created so much luxury that people naturally are going to become heedless of God. They're going to develop the God complex. That's natural. The Quran told us that. The human being always crosses his limits when he feels like he has no more needs anymore. So that the, the independence and the comfort and the luxury and the, the apparatuses of pleasure created by scientific and technological advancement, that's what created atheism in such large hordes now. And so that much we can agree with. We are a people that are spoiled more than any other generation and so we're more rebellious, more godless than any other generation. You know the famous scientist uh, Anthony Flew who wrote Why the World's Most Notorious Atheist Now Believes in God or something like this? That was the, the title of his book. He said, it took me 50 years to realize that when I was 18 and I disbelieved in God, I had no grounds for it whatsoever. I was just being silly. There's actually no philosophical grounds for saying the problem of evil, which is why he left, equals no God. Because God can know of the evil and be merciful and be all-powerful and still let it happen because he's the most wise, right? And he's the most just, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And he knows the hereafter will make him not only just, but he will even be gracious, not just. So he took, it took me 50 years to just snap out of my, my childish approach to God. It was just heedlessness. It was just the arrogance that came with our intellectuality. And so you need to know that even if someone doesn't recognize that. They need a gentle, humbling process. You know, one of our, uh, our researchers at Yaqeen, Dr. Hassan Alwan, he's a great murabbi as well. He says, and I gave this example actually in this room yesterday. I said, if I were to slap this podium, assuming it's wood, right, and pull an apple out of it, you'd be blown away. You'd say, this is miraculous, this is supernatural. So why don't we feel like every apple that is produced out of a wooden branch on every single tree is miraculous and supernatural? It's not like the, there's absence of signs. There's just presence of arrogance. You understand the issue here? We, with, you know, like with telescopes and microscopes, can see more signs of God than previous generations, but because there's more arrogance there, more darkness to the heart, the heedlessness doesn't prevent us, doesn't allow us to make use of any of it. You know, it's like Surah Al-Kahf, by the way. They told me it take a little longer than 20 minutes due to Imam Suhaib. Uh, he actually caught COVID, so may Allah give him a cure, say Ameen, and make it an elevation for his ranks. Uh, so I'll split the extra time with uh, our brother Muhammad Hijab. I'm winding down here for sure, but uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, the second story is like the, the trial of affluence. The man who had it made, he had a garden that nobody had. He was set up. What did he do when he walked into his garden? He doubted God, right? <laughs> he had it made and said, you know, ما أظن أن تبيد هذه أبدا. I don't think this will ever perish. This is, this is here for good, right? And there's probably no hereafter anyway. 
And if I happen to get like pulled back to God, I'm going to find some better stuff there anyway. He gave me, that if he exists and he gave me, that means he loves me. The delusion that comes with material gains. And it's so sad because the owner of that garden had produce, right? The apple example. Likewise, we have science. Instead of driving us to God, it blinds us from God. What's the whole problem here? It is humility. So that, that is your issue. Moisten someone's heart to humidity, hu humility. Finally, I, there's a f story that I always circle back to in my da'wah. Uh, I was in a university in New York City. And they asked me to speak on the subject of God loves you. And so I just strung together what we know from Allah introducing himself to us in the Quran. You know about his love and his mercy and his compassion and his care. Ayat and a hadith, ayat and a hadith, nothing more. I know that's enough and I know that's best. A few days later, I get an email from a sister. She says to me, I'm really sorry. I had to walk out of your lecture. I couldn't be there. I was getting too emotional. I'm having a crisis of faith. I need to speak to someone. So me and my wife make an appointment with her a few days later. We drive over. We meet her in the cafeteria of the university. I buy fries like for myself and her. The path to the heart is the stomachs. Remember that one, okay? I'm dead serious. It works. Uh, like, because <laughs> you know, when I say don't debate, they're going to keep wanting to drag you into the debate, right? Uh, and so, let's get some food. <laughs> You're my brother and sister outside of this conversation, right? Keep, it, it is not cowardice, it is strategy, right? So anyway, uh, we sat down, fries were there, and she says, I don't even know where I stand. I said, where? Prophethood, oneness of God, existence of God. She's like, rewind, all the way back. I don't even know if there's a God. I said, okay. So I'm already like wondering, like, if there's no God, if God is just imaginary, then why would you get emotional if I'm talking about how awesome God is in my lecture, right? If it's a fairy tale, it shouldn't move you. I didn't tell her this. Then I'm thinking, well, how should I approach this? So I just started talking about like cause and effect and contingency arguments and this stuff, but I wanted to like, you know, dilute it for mass consumption. So there was a napkin in front of me on the table with the fries. So I said to her, like, if this napkin, if I told you it got here on the table all by itself, would you believe this? Or would you think I'm crazy? She's like, no, come on, that can't be true. I said, okay, let's take it a step up. What if I told you the napkin manufactured itself by, on its own? She said, yeah, that would be harder to believe. And I sort of dragged it out. I kept escalating from the napkin to the cell phone, from the cell phone to the universe, and so on and so forth, right? Deliberately. And I just kept talking. And then like, I don't know how long it was, maybe five, ten minutes. I'm just like, sister, can I stop yet? Uh, she's like, I told her, like, I'm a sheikh. They give me a microphone, give me 45 minutes, and I just go. They press start. Like, you got to tell me when to stop. Is this working? You know what she said to me? And you feel like such an idiot. <laughs> she said, you had me at the napkin. And the reason I cite this, why did she walk out if it's fantasy? Why was the simplest proof you know, enough for her is that people ultimately, they want to believe in God, and not just want to. People want to connect with Him as well. You see, when I say atheism, you need to understand the, the, the domain in which you're playing. There is a worldwide decline in what is called hard or true atheism. Like atheism is just like a placeholder for people. Like, I'm not down with organized religion, or I'm not sure if there's proof for God, or something like this, right? The agnos and the, lot, many of these people don't know the nuances between these terms, right? But atheism as in like asserting that there is no God, and this is, this is a stillbirth. This was born dead, it was never meant to keep its momentum, it's against the grain. There's a worldwide, you know, decline in this sort of, because you know why? Fitra, right? Like psychologically, emotionally, people are unwilling to accept that there's no explanation for where I came from, why I'm here, where I'm going. That just creates too much anxiety. The human being is not willing to accept this, right? And so, like, no, I'm not going to believe that I'm just going to wake up on a bus and just enjoy the ride without asking how I got here, who's driving, where are we going. No, I'm not going to accept this. And considering that is the case, don't now assume that, oh, the world's coming back to religion. No, the world most of the world, if you actually probe a little bit, that leave, you know, religion, 
they maybe dabble with atheism, they wind up in negative theology or what are called the nuns or the non-religious or whatnot or the agnost or whatever it is. And I find this so profound because the Quran, the Quran never really addresses atheism head on. It doesn't. Like, it, 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 when it speaks about arguments that could be told to an atheist, it says them in a rhetorical, like, Afillahi shak, like, is there any? Meaning there absolutely isn't any doubt regarding God. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in, were they created out of nothing? That's a rhetorical. That's not a real question, you know, as if the person doesn't, that's supposed to humble you and say, no, of course not, we were not created out of nothing. It dismisses the hard atheist because there is no hard atheist. There is no true atheist. There could be someone trying to continually bury that notion of theirs. But then you, when you realize, wait, the Quran doesn't really like take on atheism head on and Allah knew that atheism would sort of rise in certain periods, very rarely, but it would, why? But then you see the Quran goes to great lengths. If everyone believes in God, then why does the Quran go to great lengths in describing him? Because there's a world of difference between having a placeholder saying supreme being, God, and Allah out there, right? even pagans would use the word, and between knowing Allah enough, right? Learning about developing your God image, if I can borrow the psych term from yesterday, in a way that would make him relevant for you. And I'm willing to submit to him and accept him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why, by the way, the, uh, describing God to people as framed by the Quran is the true route to curing atheism for those that are receptive. You're like, uh, hijab's gonna kill me again. I can't believe, I'm not throwing shade. I swear to God, I'm not throwing shade. He did his PhD in the Kalam cosmological argument and we need more of this. But uh, I personally, without getting sectarian here, I don't believe that there is much value at all in getting into discussions that intellectually prove God's existence. And I need to be done in four minutes. Why? Because I believe if you get to a point where you're doubting God's existence, that's not the real issue. The issue could be your, your mechanism with which you're processing. It's blurred by heedlessness, blurred by arrogance, blurred by radical skepticism, cynicism. You know, read the story of Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, for example, who when he went down the philosophical path and he punctured through it, became a master of it, many Westerners think he's the consider him, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, consider him the greatest critique of, you know, Greek philosophy, for example. Some Westerners consider him this. But what did he arrive at? This, all this stuff is just a sham, right? He at the end had a fallout even with rational theology, right? And then, let's leave Ghazali for a second. Rene Descartes, you know, guys know the concept of like Cartesian doubt. Descartes basically said, I can't trust anything. The only thing I know is that I think. I think, therefore, I am. That's what they tell you in Philosophy 101, right? I think, therefore, I am. You don't know that Descartes had a crisis of faith, and he said, wait a minute, how do I know I think? How do I know, basically, I'm not in the matrix? How do I know that I'm not a brain in a jar with wires plugged into it, like being manipulated my thoughts? How do I know I think? It's skepticism. Doubting is not a path to knowledge. It is a path to further doubt. It's a black hole. How do I know I'm not part of an alien's video game? Nobody say good point, please. <laughs> right? And so you know, what, you know what Descartes said in the end? He needed an anchor for his I think. And that anchor was God. He said, you know what? There has to be something that is a given. There must be a God, he said. And God must not be a deceiver or else there's no point in even trying to think things through. And so removing God from skepticism. Removing God from the intellectual discussion is the way to do things. When you do your da'wah with someone, I'm going to say it again. Invoke their fitrah that you know is there. Invoke the ayat of Allah, the verses I gave you an example of, and the universe, right, we spoke about. And then also, you want to rattle their confidence in their intellectuality with a little bit of logic, a little bit of reasoning, whether it's like inductive reasoning, the empirical, the science, or deductive reasoning, the, Sure, fine, but let it start with the fitrah. Let it start with the ayat of Allah, the observed and the recited. And let it be this also, and the bridge for all of those proofs to get into their heart after Allah's permission is what? Your manners. Keep the relationship salient, 
Your manners are the bridge over which your proofs march into people's hearts and over the walls of their defense mechanisms. Jazakallahu khairan wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.